Duncan and welcome to Back Away From The Donkey. And today, finally, I'm going to talk about to you about The Year of the Quiet Sun by Wilson Tucker. Uh, Format-wise for this video, it's probably going to be a little different. Uh, there will be some cuts and I'll be cutting stuff in between just because of the way I need to speak about this. At the end, I am going to do a talk which will have huge, huge spoilers. Uh, because there's something I want to talk about and... I really need to talk about it because I have no one to talk about it to. So there will be big spoilers and I will signpost that as much as I can. And I just recommend you just go off and read this book. Go and find a copy of it. It's I'm pretty sure it's not on Kindle. So you'd have to try and find a second hand copy of it. But you need to find it. It is a great book. So yes, you look quite sun. If you have a look at this beautiful painting on the front, Peter Elson painting that I've got on this copy so let's start it is a it was a Hugo nominee uh, released in 1971 and it's a time basically a time travel book and the thing I find time travel time travel I love the concept but it's so often done really really badly often it's just an excuse to write historical fiction or write a story somebody wants and we know it's all there just so that people can write the story they want to but this is time travel done well. It's done simply and it's there to tell the plot and the story that Tucker Wilson wanted to. Cheney fitted two keys into the twin locks and shoved. A bell rang somewhere behind him. The operations door rolled easily on roller mite tracks. He stepped outside into the chill of the future. So the author, author is Wilson Tucker. I've gone into a bit of Wilson Tucker rabbit hole recently because I've started uh, reading his, some of his books. I recently read Time Masters, which is where we're picking up. Uh, he was a movie projectionist until 1971-72. He wrote, I think around about 20 odd novels. Uh, some of them action, some of them mysteries, and quite a lot of them science fiction, and lots and lots of short stories. Uh, this one, Year of Quite Sun, uh, was Hugo Nebula nominated, and should have won, and people should remember it, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the Long Loud Silence, one he wrote in a post-apocalyptic book in 1951, which I am desperately after a copy of. Uh, it's not on digital anywhere. It's really hard to find a copy of, but apparently it is a stunning post-apocalyptic book, and I need a copy of it. So if anybody sees one around, buy it, as long as it's not silly money, and I'll pay you for it, because I want a copy. Uh, so yeah, Long Loud Silence by Wilson Tucker. But this is, I said, one of his most famous ones, Year of the Quiet Sun. Okay, so I'm going to give you a synopsis now. This is a no-spoilers synopsis. Well, nothing that's going to affect the whole plot, unlike what I'm going to tell you later. And we follow a man called Brian Chaney. And Brian Chaney is a biblical scholar, a demographer, uh, and he is recruited by uh, Catherine Van Hees, I think her name is, yes, it's, it's like a Dutch, to test basically a time machine. Uh... Brian Chaney himself is quite infamous. He, in his biblical studies, he translated a scroll that's meant to predate uh, the Book of Revelations and basically have the Book of Revelations on there. It's basically a midrash, which is apparently, I only found this out, is a Jewish word for like a fictional story. And basically he upset lots of people and all he did was translate this. Uh, but she helps the recruiting for a test of this time machine they've developed along with a colonel and a, another soldier the time machine works by being in one place and somebody goes into it and then they come out in exactly the same place in a certain time there you don't sort of feel yourself moving anything uh, and the government want to use the time machine to very cynically see how policies and things develop uh, so the president wants to know if he'll get re-elected so they are going to start the three guys are going to separately start jumping forward in time Cheney said quietly Seabrook has picked up a very hot alternative if we can't go up there for a survey our team is going back to film the crucifixion yeah this whole idea of time traveling to see what's happening is it's quite a cynical you could I said in today's political time you could really see politicians doing things like this which is what I found quite interesting about the whole thing and, but the plot develops as the final part is that Brian Cheney goes into the far future of 2010. Okay, the far future of 2010. And in it, he discovers certain things. He has three jumps 
he does three different time zones and he discovers things about the world as it's developed certain riots going on and the breakdown of society and i think the best description i heard is it's like a slow creeping apocalypse if you find you will find with um if you read a few tucker wilson books and i said i've read, read uh two or three now so far his style seems to be it's very very laid back it's very slow and it's the reveal is quite at the end. And I can see why some people won't get on with it. To me, this book is a bit of a masterpiece. Uh, I forgot a masterpiece and it should be up there. I do not understand why it's not been reprinted. I do not understand why it's almost been forgotten. Written sort of the back end of the 1960s. Uh, unsurprisingly, there's a bit of misogyny in it. Uh, uh, the sole female character, Catherine Van Hees, is... She's more of a foil, a foil for Cheney's character, but what Cheney does. And I said, that's the problem, is I can't really tell you what he does without revealing <laughs> certain things. So that's when the second part of this comes in. Uh, but she's needed as that foil, and that's part of what makes the plot do. Do not expect the plot to whack you over the head and go, well, from the beginning, there's a reveal towards the end. And that's when it all pulls itself together. And it's, I, after I read it, I started, went around and read a few people's reviews and thoughts on the book. And somebody described it as an intimate apocalypse. And I thought that was a great uh, sort of description. Because really there's four characters in the whole of the film. But really you're concentrating on two. Which is both Catherine and Brian Chaney. And you just follow them through to the inevitable conclusion. To the conclusion. <laughs> now we come to spoiler talk. Okay. Go off. Read the book. If you go past this point, I am spoiling the book for you. Okay. I'm going to give you the reveal. And the reveal is a bit I really wanted to talk about. Uh, so I suggest you go off, find a copy. They're available. Look on a books anywhere. Find a copy, read it, come back, watch the second part of this video. Uh, it's not a thing I'm going to normally, I normally do when I talk about books. I normally don't like to put things like this in. But it's just such an interesting way, the way the whole thing develops. So yes, I've put this spoiler bit in there. So go away, come back. I'll give you a few seconds and then you can... Do your thing and then it's all your own fault if you're staying. Initially we have Brian Cheney and some of the other two the other two military guys getting sent to different times. Initially it is to see who's gonna win the next election. And the president finds out, they find out they go forward that the president does win, win the election, but at the same time, they put down a coup. And also there is riots, and mo most of these riots are race biased by the way uh, African Americans and all the minor minorities are being treated. And you have to remember, this was written at the back end of the 1960s, so there was a lot of racial tension in America at the time. So this is sort of working off that. Uh, we get the death of one character shortly afterwards. But the final part of this book, which is a bit I found really, really sort of blew you away, is your train goes to 2010 and he comes back and it's like this post-apocalyptic wasteland. There's nothing there. And he meets what is. He gets there and he finds out that the time machine, which stays there, there's no power. So he wouldn't be able to get back. You didn't come back to the laboratory, Mr. Cheney. No one saw you again after the launch. No one saw you again until you appeared here today. And he meets these two people and they talk to him. And he discovers they are Catherine Van Hees' children. And then he goes to talk to her. And there is this big reveal. And it is, the way it's done is really subtly. Because you are reading along. And it is, suddenly she suddenly says the statement. I find the original statement is. You're lucky uh, that anybody trusted you. Because out of all the people here. I, I would be one of the few people to trust a black man. And that is the only point you discover when Cheney is actually African-American. And what it is, is the fact that all the race riots and that, that developed and basically caused this sort of looming apocalypse and people distrust each other totally. But what I liked about this is this all focused on my own perceptions of the story. I sat down and read this book as a white middle-aged man living in the north of Scotland in a place where 
around here there is hardly I can think of about two or three people locally that are not white. So I assumed that the person in this book was like me. And I'm assuming that an African-American might read it or somebody from anywhere else in the world might read it and automatically put themselves in that place because it's not stated. It is not stated initially that this person is African-American. And so it, it reinforces your own perceptions and why you shouldn't, why you're not jumping to conclusions. I wrote, what did I write down here? When Tucker Wilson is talking earlier on in the book about these race riots, they are in like the background material. So they're not really pushed to the forefront. So you don't actually, you register them, but it's just like there when they're describing what's going on in the future after they've come back. Yeah, the way Wilson, he drops it into the narrative is really, really subtle and you read it and I had to go back and reread it again. Then I reread it about 30 times because it's quite a bit of a bombshell considering what's gone on before. And I think because it's done in that subtle way, it does make you assess your own assumptions and your own prejudices, which I think is really what makes this so interesting. And as I said, it's this looming apocalypse all caused by uh, situations from the late 60s, early 70s. And what happened could have quite easily happened if you read your history if you know your uh, probably people know their American history better than I do because I'm not American but if you see what happened back there what he predicted could have happened these ideas within the book sort of st I found they stuck with me and I was thinking about it for quite a few days afterwards I wrote notes for this um, little this video I'm doing which I hope in your understanding and it just stuck with me and it also made me in mind as a episode of Jordan Peele's Twilight Zone reboot. If you've ever watched it, uh, it was great. And if you've not watched it, you should have watched it. There's an episode called, I wrote it down here, what was it called? It was called Replay. And in that replay, they got this camera looking like replay, part, literally replay force, something that's happened to go over again. And you're following these African-American family and somebody gets shot by a policeman and they keep replaying it to try and all do all these situations but no matter what they do the outcome is always the same and the whole thing is almost implying that no matter what somebody does whatever they try to do the prejudices will cause these things to happen and for some reason the reveal within uh quiet sun made me think of that don't know why it just did it just came to me and I've not lived in that, obviously, experience because I said I'm a white middle-aged man from Scotland. So <laughs> here I am. Um, but it all made me think. And I said the fact that I related quite some to that, I thought was quite interesting. But anyway, that is my sort of weird little sum-up of this book. You had quite some Tucker Wilson. And as far as I'm concerned... It is a masterpiece. I really do think it is a masterpiece. It's a very quite a short book. So if you can get hold of a copy, which I think you should be able to, there are copies flying around. It's 191 pages. So it's a great, great book. I said, if you see copies of Long Loud Silence, I want a copy. I really do. Uh, but anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I will be doing my next one. Uh, I think more in depth thing on a Spider Robinson book, I think, but don't hold me to that. But anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this and I hope I've made sense and I will speak to you all very soon. Bye bye.